Well, welcome to this talk, and um, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Asim Mulhotra, friend of the channel, medical researcher, um, uh, health promoter, consultant, cardiologist, author, and uh, all round uh, good and fascinating bloke. <laughs> Asim, thank you for, for coming so, back on. John, it's always great to chat to you. Maybe you forgot to mention at the end, maybe disruptor on there. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, always, I, always, I always forget something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, dissent, dissenting voice, which we're delighted to hear. Now, you're actually in California at the moment, I seem. You're, you're going to be speaking at a conference called Reclaiming Food and Medicine, Ending Corporate Corruption and uh, Global Disease. So that is a plug for the conference, but let me just let seem or nor myself have any financial interest in this whatsoever. We want to promote what is uh, being talked about. So... Uh, what do you mean reclaiming food, Asim? Surely if you're hungry, you just go to McDonald's in California, don't you? Why does food need to be reclaimed? <laughs> yeah, John, no, I'm glad you've raised uh, that specific issue. So I think, you know, the, the aim of this particular conference is to try and give people a in-depth um, but easy to understand um, analysis, if you like, of what really is at the heart of our chronic disease pandemic and of course we're in the heart of uh, you know the, the sort of the corporate influence around the world of, of um, big food big farming in the United States I'm in California for a number of reasons one is to help you know to, to do this event um, in San Jose but also uh, we're also finishing filming of our documentary first do no farm which will also be linked to these big <laughs> issues but you know you mentioned the issue about food and I think it's um, something that we've been discussing probably in the UK and in other countries for almost two decades now. 2004, World Health Organization announced that there was a, a global pandemic or epidemic of obesity. And yet we've not really made any significant strides into combating it. So what we want to do through the conference, part of what we're going to, I'm going to try and explain to people is to help people understand the root cause of the issue, help them understand the difference between the kind of foods or diets they're going to follow that's going to give them good health and keep them in um, you know, in trim shape, but also the kind of diets that are, are not going to do that. And, and the reality, unfortunately, John, is that there's a combination of flawed science around things like low fat foods. We're still dealing with the, um, the end result of that. But I think a deeper understanding of what's driving the obesity epidemic is, is also for people to acknowledge at the forefront of their consciousness that the food environment has a much bigger impact on your behavior and what you eat than the actual education alone, right? And, uh, and I think people need, the, the more people understand that, the more chance we've got of actually making inroads to tackling this problem of obesity and diet-related disease. Um, I would say that the low-hanging fruit, just to simplify it for people in a way, is ultra-processed foods. Um, I think, you know, if someone was to try and Think, understand where this all started and, and how we've got here. You know, up until about 1980, for example, there wasn't really much obesity at all in the UK or around the world. Um, mm. And so something's happened since then. And I don't think it's that we've suddenly become more irresponsible, we've become more sedentary since then, and that we've decided that we're just going to eat more junk food. I think something in the environment has triggered an overconsumption of the types of foods that are going to interfere with hormones that control appetite, that are going to increase the chances of weight gain. And when you break it down on a physiological level, I would say that the, the key driver really is, is insulin resistance, um, which is being driven by sugar and refined carbohydrates predominantly. Uh, and that's really what makes up most of the constituents of ultra-processed food. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you used the term pandemic there, Asim, because I think this is really a situation we are in. Um, obesity is just so common. High blood pressure, very, very common. Diabetes uh, type 2, also incredibly common. And, and these things often go together in, in this thing called, called metabolic syndrome. So just to be a bit geeky for a minute, what's the yeah. relationship between metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance? Are they kind of the same thing? Yeah, essentially, uh, John, they are. Um, they're kind of interchangeable. Uh, metabolic syndrome is, is more precisely the um, physical manifestation of insulin resistance. And we mm -hmm. diagnose it by looking at five particular factors uh, in relation to health, metabolic health. And if three of those are out of sync or abnormal, then you've got the metabolic syndrome. So that means essentially having prehypertension or high blood pressure, 
pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, increase waist circumference, increase triglycerides in the bloodstream from your cholesterol profile, um, and low HDL or so-called good cholesterol. If any of these three are abnormal, you've got metabolic syndrome. Now, as a cardiologist, I will say that that is the associated with the increased risk, uh, the highest risk of all-cause mortality, heart attack and stroke over a 10-year period if you've got metabolic syndrome. So what that does, is, why that's important, John, is it goes beyond just the simple, slightly crude, and um, I think what should be outdated definitions of obesity, which is purely based upon a body mass index, which all, all it looks at is the definition of that, essentially the calculation of that is dividing your weight in kilograms by your height in meters squared. If it's over 30, you're obese. If it's over 25, you're overweight. And actually, we know that up to 40% of people who are so-called, who would be told or think that they're in a so-called healthy weight, they have a normal BMI, will have um, metabolic syndrome. And, and therefore, there is the concern of the illusion of protection. So I think the evolution of this discussion needs to go beyond just weight. It needs to go into the fact that we're all vulnerable. Like in the same way, at one stage, we were all vulnerable to the effects of smoking or passive smoking, regardless of our you know, uh, a weight. I think the same thing needs to apply to the, how we look at the, the, what we eat. And just put things in context on a global scale, John, a few years ago, analysis done by Professor Simon Capewell at the University of Liverpool, who's a very eminent epidemiologist, revealed that poor diet, looking at the Lancet Global Burn of Disease Reports, poor diet is responsible for more disease and death than physical inactivity, smoking and alcohol combined now. So really the low-hanging fruit, what we should all focus on primarily or one of the low-hanging fruits to focus on is fixing people's, uh, uh, you know, fixing the food to fix healthcare. What do you actually mean by ultra-processed food? Well, there's a very interesting definition that was put together by researchers in Brazil, led by a professor of nutrition in the University of Sao Paulo called um, Carlos Monteiro. And it's called, and people look this up, it's very easy to read short um, summary of explaining the different types of processing of foods. And it's called the NOVA. It doesn't stand for anything. It's N-O-V, NOVA classification. But what I tell my patients, to put it in very simple terms, um, John, from that research, is that if it comes out of a pack, so essentially it refers to industrial, you know, products, food products. If it comes out of a packet and, it, and you can count five or more ingredients right? Usually with additives and preservatives, it's ultra processed and should be avoided as much as possible. But unfortunately, John, in the UK, more than 50% of all the calories consumed by the average Brit is ultra processed food. In the States, probably similar, if not more, and many other countries, Australia, New Zealand, for example. So there is, of course, educating the public. But, you know, the way we won the war on tobacco in terms of reducing consumption which was 50% of the population, by the way. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, mm. you probably remember this more than I mm. do, but 50% of the population were smokers, mm. adult population were smokers in mm. 1970. Now we're down to about 17%. Mm. I mean, uh, I remember when I was a kid, you get on an aeroplane and there were ashtrays on every, uh, on every mm. seat. Disgusting. <laughs> but it's yeah. extraordinary, yeah. isn't it? You yeah. think about it now. Yeah. And, and what really yeah. drove down consumption, of course, you need to educate people. But the real drivers mm. of reducing down was, was, a, was targeting <laughs> the availability and the affordability as well as the acceptability of cigarettes. And that meant taxing cigarettes. It meant public smoking bans. It means stopping sponsorship of sports. I, I'm a huge cricket fan. I remember I used to watch Test Match Cricket when I was growing up. And you'd see Benson and Hedges was typically the, the main sponsors. <laughs> and that now, yeah. all those, a lot of the sporting events have been replaced with either junk food companies promoting their products or ultra-processed mm. food. So all these things add up. But I think the, the, the deeper understanding needs to... For, is for people to realize that marketing and making the unhealthy choice the default choice right now, which is what it is, wherever you go, um, you find that, and even in hospitals, is actually the root, the real root of the problem. I mean, John, 75%, just think about this, 75% of food purchased in hospitals in the UK is ultra-processed food. What's going on there? What sort of message does it send out as well? It, what it does is it, it makes people subconsciously think that these foods are acceptable and it doesn't really have that much of an impact on your health as, as much as it really does. And I think that's, again, all these things need to be tackled. Now, education is important. And part through the conference, we're going to disseminate the information on that, that people can empower themselves and we want people to be empowered. But we also need to engage with politicians and people who control laws that allow this to happen in the first place. And this is really 
at the root of the issue of the conference as well, or what we're discussing is the increasing unchecked, both visible and invisible power of these big corporations, whether it's big food or big pharma, and how they influence our health and decision making when it comes to our health. And unfortunately, um, the, their, their primary motive, their legal obligation is to produce profit for shareholders, and they will often put profits before people. And of course, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that's going to cause a detrimental effect on our, on our physical and mental health. So you've got these food companies and presumably they want to make as much profit as they can, which, which is what companies do. So is there a motivation there to put in uh, cheap food that's, for example, refined carbohydrates, high fructose, corn syrup, whatever it is, trans fatty acids? Is there a temptation there to put in these foods that are cheap but can taste quite nice and make the food palatable? Uh, at the expense of health considerations. Oh, absolutely, John. I think it's a little bit beyond that. I think there's increasing evidence now showing that many of these ultra-processed foods actually fulfil criteria for having addictive properties. Mm. And when it becomes addictive, it's a, a, a completely you know new conversation that needs to be had, like with tobacco, yeah. because you know addiction is the opposite of free will. Yeah. And of course, it makes sense for them as big companies to sell food to try and increase consumption. So if they yeah. are putting ingredients together, ingredients together with additives and preservatives, using food scientists to make those foods not just hyper palatable, but addictive, then of course, it's a big money spinner for them, isn't it? What do we need to replace it with? Meat and two veg, mate. <laughs> okay. Nothing complicated. Traditional <laughs> yeah. British diet, meat and two veg, we're doing pretty well. Uh, with with that diet traditionally, I mean, I obviously, of course, you know, have looked and researched into a bit more detail on a heart disease perspective, on looking at the totality mm. of evidence and what I tend to prescribe to my patients or advise them to eat, and the people that want to prevent heart disease or want to even potentially manage and reverse it is, I always say that you know, go for a, a Mediterranean style diet, which is devoid or min minimized in refined carbohydrates, starch, and sugar. Mm. And that seems to also interestingly have the, the quickest impact on their metabolic health risk factors, um, as well as likely having some anti-inflammatory components from things like extra virgin olive oil, nuts and seeds, for example, whole fruit and veg, which is at the root of heart disease. You know, the two pathophysiological processes that uh, are the twin evils that drive heart disease predominantly are chronic inflammation and insulin resistance. So I... Mm -hmm. You know, have written about this and done analyses and, and written editorials in medical journals suggesting that actually the best dietary pattern for that is probably a low-carb Mediterranean diet. Of course, these, this information will evolve and I'm open to better, better data coming out. But to make it simple, John, people just cut out the ultra-processed foods. You know, um, you want to eat foods that fulfills your nutritional requirements. Um, you know, you'll get enough protein, micronutrients, vitamins, for example, but also food that isn't going to uh, exacerbate insulin resistance now. Am I being here? Uh, am, I, am I coming across? I don't want to come across as a, a sort of party pooper. We all like the occasional treat. But I think what's happened is the occasional treat, which used to be, you know, maybe having dessert once or twice a week has suddenly become, you know, three times a day for a lot of people. And they don't, don't even know it because a lot of these sugars are hidden in these ultra processed yeah. foods. And it's not yeah. obvious that it's, yeah. you know, and, that, and it's causing such a negative impact on our health and society. Type 2 diabetes is soaring. Obesity is still going up, um, you know, and... Uh, we need to really just hit, you know, tackle it head on. But we need courageous politicians to stand up as well. I'll give you an example of how they've co-opted uh, public policy. A few years ago, John, I won't name this person, um, but let me just say somebody extremely senior as a nutritionist, very, very influential, powerful person in public health England. Um, I had a coffee with this person. And I asked them a very simple question, because of course there are so-called diet wars going on out there about whether it's saturated fat, or whether a vegan diet's healthiest, or whether people want to eat carnivore. But I said the one low-hanging fruit that people can agree on probably is to you know, reduce the, um, uh, the acceptability and promotion of, of what most people would consider junk food, like cakes, biscuits, all that kind of stuff, sugary drinks. Now, if you look at the Eat Well Guide, the so-called healthy guidance in the UK, You've got like a plate on there, which, by the way, interestingly, the stakeholders who had a say on what goes on that plate, which is, you know, a poster in NHS hospitals include um, representatives of, of people like Kellogg's and Coca-Cola and Nestle. So okay, that's another story. But on that guide in the corner, they've got things like cakes and biscuits and crisps and that kind of stuff on there. And what they say next to it is 
eat less often and in small amounts. That's all they put on there. Question is, why is it on there in the first place? And when I questioned this public health England nutritionist about it, her response to me was, Asim, you've got to understand one of the biggest contributors to our economy is the food industry. That was the answer. Not that it's about good science or best practice. That was the answer. So that tells you how much lobbying and capture has occurred with uh, government agencies and government bodies. And then on the back of me writing my, co-authoring my first book, The Piopi Diet with Donal O'Neill, Tom Watson, uh, who you may remember was the deputy leader of the Labour Party. Now he lost a hundred pounds following yeah. the diet I'd recommended on that, which is basically you re- eat real food, quit out the sugar. And he was very strong in promoting and suggesting that this is what helped him and it may help others. And uh, uh, off the back of that uh, book you know, that came out and I got endorsements from people like Andy Burnham, who was the mayor of Manchester, I even got the chair of the medical Royal colleges, arguably the you know, most important doctor in the UK at the time, Professor Dame Sue Bailey, to endorse the book because I thought, actually, this is something that the medical profession needs to look at, look at as well because the data is very strong even on type 2 diabetes reversal. Mm. What happened as a result after that is the, and this was then exposed in a Sunday Times article, John, you can look it up if you like, um, is that the chief executive of Public Health England at the time, which is now UK HSA, called up a hospital where I was going to give a talk about this at to try and get me uh, to get the chief executive to make sure that I wasn't allowed to speak. And they also tried to contact both Andy Burnham and the chair of the medical oncologist to tell them to dissociate themselves from me in the book, which means that their endorsements now would become void to try and embarrass me to say that this is uh, very bad, um, will be negative press. And they stood their ground and the Sunday Times exposed it. And there's a story which people look up online saying Tom Watson, who was a deputy liver, diet doc- Tom Watson's diet doctor, um, uh, hit by government dirty tricks campaign. So really this just tells you that when you want to speak out and you're having impact and you're trying to promote good evolved science free from commercial influence, these are the types of attacks that can come your way. But you know, I'm still here. And I think people need to hear these stories and what's really going on behind the scenes as well. It's almost as if there's some links between the food industry and uh, government, isn't it? <laughs> Do you reckon? <laughs> oh, well, it's beyond my pay grade, I seem, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, well it's, one, just, it's just thing... a marker of lobbying, mate. It's a, it's a lobbying yeah. issue. They spend a lot of yeah. money uh, in lobbying these politicians. Yeah. Um, but they, the, for me, though, John, the thing that I think I find most um, concerning is the fact they've infiltrated even supposedly independent scientific nutritional scientists mm. or whether it's, mm. you know, whether it's medical regulators, you know, and, and that's where things have gone too far, I think. It's the threat to fundamental science that I see perhaps is the most significant uh, effect here. Uh, I get so many questions. Should I be cutting down on saturated fats? The honest answer is no. Um, you know, if you, the foods that tend to be high in saturated fats are things like dairy, red meat, for example. Um, when you look at the totality of evidence from systematic reviews, observational studies, even randomized controlled trials, there is absolutely no clear link between saturated fat consumption and heart disease or any adverse health outcome, actually. Uh, and if people want to look at the summary of the evidence in a peer-reviewed BMJ journal, British Journal of Sports Medicine, that I co-authored with two cardiologists who are very eminent, both editors of medical journals, if they look up and just put in, and it's free open access, so they just type in, saturated fat does not clog the arteries and put my name in there, an article will come up and they can read that with the references uh, on why saturated fat should not be of concern. We'll find that and post post the link, absolutely. I would like to get my triglycerides down and my high-density lipoprotein, my HDL up, my protective cholesterol up. How do I get my triglycerides down and how do I get my HDL up? So, uh, very good question, important question. And of course, those are two of the markers of metabolic health. So normally, and what I find with my patients, is if you reduce your, in fact, the, what I would suggest people do is that for three to six weeks, John, completely first and foremost, go cold turkey on all starch and sugar. So no bread, no pasta, no rice, no potatoes, no sweets, nothing with added sugar. It's not forever, just to see what, what that can do and then repeat the triglycerides. And that will often bring them down significantly. Um, the other thing that uh, people get caught out uh, on is often their triglycerides aren't measured fasted. So make sure you measure it fasted because if it's measured after food, it can be artificially high and it's not accurate. Okay. And the third one is alcohol. Yeah. 
excess alcohol consumption will raise your triglycerides. But actually, if you do all those things, usually that will also push the HDL up. Um, interestingly, you know what pushes HDL up? Saturated fat. <laughs> so, but, but my focus would be managing the insulin resistance, and often those markers, if you like, of insulin resistance will improve. Yeah, and, and d- does exercise help with insulin resistance? It does. It does it definitely, John. But the interesting thing is you don't need to do a lot, um, to be honest. I think the key thing is not being sedentary. So if you, mm-hmm. you, know, if you do a 30-minute walk mm-hmm. once or twice a day, a brisk walk or walking the dog, I mean, from, from a heart disease and longevity perspective, you're probably already in the optimal range. You mm-hmm. don't need to be pounding it. I mean, people obviously like to do that and enjoy it, but you, know, you don't have to be pounding it for hours in the gym, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you look at the, um, you know, another example of why you don't need to do that, people, people will, will, will get this. If you look at the blue zones, so these are areas around the world, a handful of, of, of communities around the world which have unusually high longevity and health. Mm, mm. None of these communities were, had gyms. They weren't pounding in the gym. They were just outside <laughs> walking in the hills, yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, um, yeah. you know, keep it simple. Just, just don't spend prolonged periods on your backside. That's all I would say. Yep. Great, Asim. Thank you. Now, the last, the last question I've got is, what specific diseases am I likely to avoid if I follow your advice? Well, okay. So the one thing we haven't discussed yet, so we've talked about diet and exercise. I think the other big elephant in the room, John, which is something I think collectively we're not managing very well at all, and maybe individually too, is chronic psychological stress. So mm. when you look from a heart disease perspective, chronic stress, which I think affects probably most people these days, yeah. and, and probably got worse during the pandemic, has an attributable, attributable risk of, for heart attack as hypertension or smoking or type 2 diabetes. Mm. So, you know, imagine so many people going around with chronic stress and they, they're essentially doubling their risk of heart disease and not doing anything about it. So I think that's something else people need to think about and get in check. I mean, good quality sleep, maybe things like meditation, um, joining a class, spending more time with friends and family, certainly non-toxic people, <laughs> people mm, that you yeah, like. Yeah. All these things yeah. have an impact. So that's what I would say that people need to be doing. And when you put it all together, Actually, these sort of lifestyle, the diet, the exercise, stress reduction, you probably, I mean, certainly with the literature, probably could eliminate, um, you know, the majority of heart disease, strokes, cancers, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's all, I mean, to be honest, it's, and there's a lot of data even emerging on osteoarthritis and, and chronic autoimmune conditions as well, John. So I think you're giving yourself the best opportunity possible mm. to, to optimize your health if you optimize all those factors and it really isn't that hard just eat sensible food plenty of vegetables eat some meat cook it yourself what what, what i do what i well try and do is i'll make a big pan of something so um i had some courgettes at the allotment so i made a huge pan of courgette soup uh with potato and onion i've been eating it for the last four days now so if you if you make a big pan of something and then keep it for a few days that, that, that that's what works for me uh, otherwise because i can't be bothered or well, my wife can't yeah. be bothered cooking every, every, every between us we can't be bothered cooking every day so yeah no, john the you, other thing i think worth mentioning as well i'm glad you've raised that is uh, mm. what what patients come back to me with and they find surprising within a, a few weeks of these lifestyle changes is they find their quality of life improves they feel they've got more energy they're sleeping better their mental acuity is better so this isn't about just a long-term benefit. This is actually even short and medium-term benefits in terms of how you feel. And in fact, that once people go through that phase initially when they you know, bite the bullet and say, okay, listen, I'm going to be super disciplined just for three weeks just to see if Dr. Mahatra is right um, and help or see how I feel. Massive impact, massive. Mm-hmm. I mean, I must say, I often feel like I could do with slightly lower anxiety levels. I could do with my mood being a bit higher than it was there were my volitional levels being a bit higher than than they are um and, and these things are all tied together the mind body thing is all is, is all one thing isn't 100%. it 100 percent. i mean that's one of the things i think that was missing in our medical training john is that we looked as organ systems as, as separate entities rather than the fact that it's all linked mm. um, and what i say is you can't have optimal mental health without having optimal physical health. And you can't have optimal physical health without having optimal mental health. Yeah. So they have to be taken together, yeah. you know. Um, and I think the, the sooner that more of us adopt that and the sooner that doctors put that at the forefront of their consciousness when they're managing patients, um, the better it's going to be for the health of the population Absolutely. and for society. Absolutely. So if you are in the San Jose area, where the heck is that, Asim? 
Um, it's on the outskirts of San Francisco. Okay. So it's about 30 miles um, south of San Francisco, and uh, it's called the San Jose, Jose Civic Center. It's a beautiful venue, uh, about 3,000 people capacity. Um, you know, I, when I went to visit it the other day, I was, I was so pleasantly surprised that they've had the likes of the Rolling Stones, Barbara Streisand, uh, The Who, who've played there in their day. So quite historic. And now we've and, got Dr. Mulhotra as well. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a medium for a collective message. But, um, no, and, and the other people speaking are Robert Kennedy Jr., um, Dr. Vandana Shiva, who's a, a, an environmental activist, amazing. And then it's being moderated by Dr. Drew Pinsky, who's a well-known name in the US. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get it sold out quite quickly. No, it's all not for profit, just to make that very clear. Nobody's making money out of it. There's a, there's a very... Um, a philanthropic wealthy businessman from Australia who's very keen on this message getting out. So he's put the money down for the venue. I think once the money's been made back from ticket sales, in fact, I've been assured of this, any excess that's made is going to go to charity. This is really just an opportunity for us to come together, different perspectives, different um, specialities, and, uh, and try and put the big picture issue together for people to really understand what's truly going on, you know, information that's free from commercial influence. Yeah. And let pe make people be free to choose the food that they want. It's about, it's about freedom of choice. It's about informed consent. 100%. It's, not, it's, it's not about big corporations lobbying big government to control the, the amount of food that people get to, to, to give them addictive foods. It's about simple foods. And, you know, you can come home from work and you can say, you know, you know, I think what I'd like to I'd like today, I'd like a, whatever it is, a, you know, a, 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 por a pork chop and a huge portion of cabbage and a few potatoes. But that's your choice. It's not it's not something that's being foisted upon you. It's it's about it's a freedom of will issue to me. Yeah, sure. I should be free to choose what I eat, what medicines I take, what vaccines I take. Should yeah. be my choice based yeah. on informed consent. Hundred percent, John. And this is about exactly that, and and understanding that um, to help people realise how they may be getting manipulated in those free choices and what they can do about it. And I think a lot of everyone that comes there, other than understanding big other big issues that are tied to policy, they will probably be very empowered on an individual level to really you know, separate fact from fiction when it comes to how they can manage their own health. Yeah. And for all that valuable insight to seem, thank you very much, as always. Um, it's amazing people can be sitting at their armchair and have the, uh, the the wisdom of a consultant cardiologist who's done extensive research in this delivered directly to their YouTube channel. Quite amazing, uh, but only because you're prepared to give the time. So thank you very much. Likewise, John. Thank you so much. Thank you.